What's going on, everybody? This is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition, and today I have the honor of just having one of my favorite writers on the show, and that is Garth Ennis. How's it going, Mr. Ennis? It is going good, Omar. Hello to you. Hello, hello, sir. And uh, the gentleman that put most of this together along with Vincent is Joe up there at the top, uh, working at Dynamite. And what exactly is your position at Dynamite, sir? You lost the mic. I just saw the message. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, awesome. Well, I will. He's technical uh, support. Yeah. Yeah, we can do this live. I'll put you down there, and then uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get that figured out. Uh, but Joe works at Dynamite. He's been working on projects with Garth in the past, and one of those projects has been uh, The Boys and these wonderful oversized omnibus editions that have come out in hardcover format. And they are freaking awesome. As the omnibus is my favorite format, um, I, I was so happy to see that because the definitive editions have been out of print for so many years that a lot of my subscribers that they like the bigger books, the bigger editions, and The Boys happens to be one of their favorite series. So when there was talk about it a couple of years ago, everybody was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's make it happen, please, please. So how do you feel about that particular edition, Garth, like the, these omnibus editions, these hardcovers? Uh, I'm very pleased with them. I think they turned out nicely. I was talking to Joe about this recently, actually. Um, I always feel that it's so much it's so much more important i think uh thinking in terms of the collection rather than the individual issue because that's how the book's going to live in perpetuity um a collection of course uh is how it lives and um i think the um i think the the, the less number of books the, the smaller number of books containing the uh the most amount of material possible the better um doesn't mean that it has to be some behemoth that you're going to drop in your foot and cripple yourself with uh but at the same time uh something with as much story as possible as much bang for your buck um something durable um and something that allows you to get the whole story into as few editions as possible so that uh you're not messing around with some giant collection uh we mentioned uh previously actually that uh, the boys started out as 12 books uh, they got it down to six, now they've got it down to three, which I think is ideal. So 12 trades and then down to three of these. Yeah, the, even the yeah. definitive editions, there were six of those, and those are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like with the popularity of like the show, people are now checking it out. People that normally don't read comics, and I love that, right? Because there are a small amount but still an amount of people that come and check out comics when they go see movies, they go see TV shows. And it's my job. I like to think to lead them in the right direction. So when I, when the show started coming out, uh, dynamite started putting out these trade paperbacks uh, known as omnibus editions too. And Joe, did you, did you help out with those as well when you were working with, with Garth on the, uh, on the trade paperbacks? Yeah, I've been his liaison from the start, from the moment that it came over from Wildstorm. And, you know, when it when we first went through collecting the material, I mean, it was always very important to us as we were doing the book, knowing that, you know, with, with a writer like Garth and his fan base and his following, that there is that second bite at the apple where people grab trades. And then the market moved more towards, okay, now bigger and better and, you know, additions and those definitive editions were beautiful. And I think we were just a little ahead of our time on doing those um, because I don't remember them being a huge, huge success. They're also very expensive too. Um, mm -hmm. And then when we took those down to the smaller omnibus size, the six collections that had the same materials, um, that was really like, that was the, the best format for those. Um, until we decided talk and talking to Garth until we decided to do um, what they've also done with his work on Preacher and uh, Hellblazer over at DC, which is bring him up to uh, a hardcover collection of those omnibuses. They still need to give us Hitman, though. Like, I don't know how that has not happened. Like, I love Hitman and trade paperbacks have been out of print for over 10 years. And there are people that hear me talk about it often on my channel. And they're like, hey, when are these books going to come back to print? 
Mm. Well, um, we were just talking about that, and it would be lovely to see. Um, you know, Hitman has never enjoyed the popularity of the other two, of, of Preacher and the Boys, even when they were monthly comics. Uh, Preacher tidally outsold Hitman by about two, two to one, something like that. Um, so it's always been more of a cult hit, I suppose you would say. I mean, it has this smaller but fanatical audience that I've always really appreciated. Um, yes, it would be nice to get Hitman back into print. It would be nice to have, say, five or four books that people could go to. Um, I would like to see that. Uh, we will just have to see how things go. Yeah, I know things are different in the way that you know, different publishers, pu publishers work. Um, I assume with, with the boys, it's something that you you probably have a little more room to say, hey, I'd like to see some hardcovers of these than maybe something like your work published at Marvel or DC. Is, uh, is that a, my assumption, right? Uh, yeah, you're, you're not far off it. I mean, occasionally at DC or Marvel, I've been able to say it might be nice to do X, Y, and Z. But what happens far more often is that they'll tell me we are doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll be it set in stone. Um, on the creator-owned books at DC, at Vertigo, um, again, there's a, there's a little more room for maneuver, but it's not the same as a Dynamite where I feel as if I'm, I'm playing a, 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 an equal role in the process of, uh, of deciding on what these books will be like and um, how, they will, how they will appear and when they will go out there. I... You know, you said something interesting uh, a minute ago about uh, Hitman. So I remember I was out of comics when Hitman was coming out. Like I, I read the first couple of issues and then I got out of high school and decided I'm taking a break from comics. But when I came back to comics, Hitman was one of those books that was just waiting there for me, along with a bunch of other things that a lot of people put into the, oh, the 90s is nothing but trash. But there are a lot of freaking phenomenal stories out there. And Hitman was one of those that a lot of people didn't talk about besides, like, one of my friends. So when I got to check it out, he let me borrow his trade paperbacks. I was like, this is genius. I loved it. And this was after I had read the um, your run on Preacher and then, of mm -hmm. course, uh, some of the other work that you had done for Marvel Comics or, like, th your, your stuff with Amanda Connor, the pro, which I love. Uh, the It was interesting to see your take on a character like superman mm -hmm. because i think throughout the comics community it's you have pretty much stated that you know you're not a fan of superheroes that's right yeah yeah so what may, what differs superman from everybody else like punisher kills the entire Mar marvel universe per se right <laughs> why does superman get the special it's okay uh you're obviously the way it felt you're obviously not the first to ask the question and i don't know that i have that decent an answer for you i mean um i usually make some crack about jesus christ fan fiction or something like that but it's the notion of it's the notion of the the most decent and kindest guy in the entire universe uh finding a way to be to to behave kindly towards everyone Th that is its own creative challenge and th there's a there's kind of an amusing quality to that um, obviously, there's his, his appearance in that issue of Hitman, but later on, I wrote him uh, in the six pack miniseries where you see him very gently uh, and quite indulgently taking this pathetic little alcoholic superhero around his fortress of solitude and slowly helping the guy understand that he, the uh, alcoholic wretch in the gutter, is the man who's dreaming the DC universe into being. Uh, you can make of that what you will. So it's as much fun to see if I can keep pulling it off as anything else. Um, maybe there is something about a guy who's the personification of everything good in the human race that that keeps me coming back, actually, that, that um, breaks down even my barriers of cynicism. But it is, as you've pointed out, uh, very much... Uh, a, a unique case. I don't feel that way about any of the others. Yeah, I can, I can tell. Um, but oh my gosh, yeah, especially <laughs> the things that happen to some of the characters in uh, the Punisher. Yep. By the way, oh my gosh, welcome back, Frank. Was 
like my welcome back to comics. Like I, I love that you went and touched upon that character and then they made it into a Max series and you wrote them for quite a number of years and you're still quite not done. And I'm hoping. No, you're right. You're, yeah. you're, you're still writing more. Good, 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 good. Yeah, there'll be a new mini series at the end of the year, uh, a Vietnam one. I like to think I can drop in and write The Punisher from time to time, uh, just come back and visit, as with Soviet, as with the new book. Yeah. Um, there is, of course, uh, the added complication that now Frank is quite a, a controversial character because yeah. of what a lot of people have kind of chosen to read into the character. Um, but I think, I think it's going to be a case of just waiting patiently and then, as I say, coming back from time to time and doing a little bit more. The, the Punisher is ultimately born of the kind of movies I grew up on, um, the kind of fiction that was prevalent in the 70s and 80s. Uh, he resembles, in essence, many of the characters I grew up on in comics uh, on, on my side of the Atlantic. Um, I've often said that he's um, he's a British character born in the American comic industry by mistake. Um, <laughs> and in that sense, he suits me down to the ground. Uh, he's a very easy character for me to write. What helps enormously, of course, is that he's actually just a human being um, with no superpowers. That's something that I find far more relatable than, than a standard superhero character. I will say that team up or team up with spider-man was one of the funniest things I've read. and i like spider-man but i thought that was, that sure. was a, a good take on the character sure well it seemed to me that uh um and other people at the time that no matter what i did in that regard and no matter how much i kept pushing um it didn't really make any difference Pete, there were howls of outrage sure but it's not as if people stopped reading Spider-Man or turned their back on Marvel Comics, which I think the cannier people at Marvel at the time, like Joe Quesada, knew very well. Uh, Joe often said that this won't make any difference to sales, uh, but it will get us attention, and that's why it's worth doing. Uh, definitely. I mean, there were people checking out the Punisher that normally wouldn't. As yeah, a matter sure. of fact, um, I remember your Punisher kills the Marvel Universe. I was working at a comic book store, and there was a guy that was just pure DC. I mean, everything was DC, except for that book. And he was like, "There's just something special about this guy." And he remembered your stuff from um, uh, Judge Dredd when you were mm -hmm. when you did some of those. And uh, he was like, "Yeah, this guy's going to be able to write Frank." And sure enough, a few years later, you were writing Frank on a monthly basis. Um. So, Joe, you mentioned that you guys, This I, I think, you know, I don't know if this is common knowledge, but the boys started at Wildstorm, which at the time was part of DC, right? And I assume there were six issues, I think, because I remember when they were coming out. I assume the, what happened was an editor saw the seventh issue and was like, we can't keep publishing this or it's not selling yeah. enough is that what happened yeah i think it went higher up than that <laughs> oh, yeah. it wasn't uh, it wasn't issue seven in particular it was actually those first six issues oh okay it was more that i think uh uh and i i should say that i never got to the bottom of this i never found out what the straw that broke the camel's back was but it wasn't issue seven it was something in those first six issues that someone finally noticed and this essentially was the problem. Wildstorm had done things, had put out a book that they shouldn't have put out, oh. containing material that shouldn't have that wouldn't have been allowed. Uh, if you want it in a nutshell, and again, I I can't get into specifics because I don't know them, but essentially it's it's that you can put out a book like Preacher, which um quite brutally satirizes organized religion and in fact drags the very notion of faith and religion through the dirt but you can't do that with superheroes because superheroes are the product at dc they're the movies they're the t-shirts they're the merchandising they're the they're the monthly income they're uh, superman batman and wonder woman are a vastly more important uh holy trinity than the father the son and the the holy ghost and so from dc's point of view what we'd done with the boys was simply untenable and we had to go 
Yeah. So even though these weren't characters that were in the DC universe, they still thought that you guys were playing too close to home. So. Yeah, I mean it's 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 not difficult to look at the seven. Yeah, and who each character is based on. Right. Okay. I mean, I think since then though they they did similar things, but that was after this. Sure. Uh, in the in well at the time it was Vertigo. Now they have the Black Label universe. Well, regardless, I'm glad that you found a home that these characters belong to you, and um, I assume also Derek Robertson, who I mm-hmm. co-create, uh, and who is also one of my favorite artists. I love that guy since he was drawing uh, New Warriors. So, yeah, like you 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 tend to have worked with uh, Derek. He was on Punisher with you, and also uh, Steve Dillon, right? That's like, right. Like yeah. Dillon, and he was a fun phenomenal artist did you did you work with steve on uh in 2000 ad is that where you guys met or was briefly yeah that was that was our first work together though it wasn't exactly how we met we met socially actually in a pub after a a signing uh many many years ago um it's interesting when you when you talk about artists like steve and Derek because it goes back to the notion of um well i suppose our starting point which is people who uh, come looking for the comic after they've seen the TV show or the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always believed that it's important if you want to have find that crossover audience. I think what you need is comic art that is clear and accessible to a mainstream audience. In other words, an audience that uh, begins outside of comics, not people who have grown up with comic books. So okay. you need the clarity of a Steve Dillon, a Derek Robertson, a Russ Braun, a Dave Gibbons on Watchmen. Yeah. Um, some of the more experimental artwork that we see in comics, uh, perhaps the more sort of uh, atmospheric, sketchier art, some of the cartoonier stuff, um, that might not translate so well. But if you give a mainstream audience, a, no, a, a non-com, non-regular comic book reader, uh, that nice, clear, nuts and bolts artwork that Derek, Steve, Dave, the other guys I mentioned can provide, um, I think that will help you down the road a long way. And that's why I'm so glad to have them on Preacher and the boys, uh, just because it, it helps you ex- uh, it, it helps you get that audience that you need if you're going to have that crossover. Yeah, that is- as as we do as we do conventions and as the show has gotten more popular and mm-hmm. we have seen pe- you know people still walk up and they they did not know it was a comic they know the show, but they didn't know the boys was a comic and I'm sure you found that during Preacher uh, as well, Garth. But yeah, absolutely. You know, and being able to give them that first collection. Um, to read, you know, knowing that if they like that show, they're going to love the comic, quite possibly even more so, because the comic goes in a lot of different directions that the show doesn't, and touches on things that the show doesn't. Um, you know, it's it, it's it's very it's it's great to be able to do that and still see a lot of that. And we've seen that over the last several years. Yeah. So. And that's that's where that nice clear art that I'm talking about comes in. Yeah, you know, I have never thought about that. I've never thought about, <sighs> and you're right. But because I've been I've been reading comics for thirty plus years, and I, I enjoy all types of art. Mm, me too. But that's not everybody, right? Like if somebody comes and sees a movie, and they're like, "Well, this is a pretty serious story," I expect pretty serious, realistic type of artwork. Maybe in their head, they already have it built up. Uh, so you're absolutely right. There are certain artists that would not work for the boy yeah. or, or or preacher for that matter. Something they can just understand, something they can follow. Uh, I mean, I we've all heard this uh, from non-comics readers that they don't know where to start, that they can't read a comic, that they find it confusing. And yeah. if you have an artist that uses um, maybe very experimental page layouts, whose storytelling isn't the strongest, who has that scratchier, sketchier style of art, um, well, that won't help that audience at all. Um, I found again and again that, uh, I mean, I'm not going to mention anything here, but I I have heard from people who had uh, a comic book that was uh, translated into film or TV, and the publisher printed up a great many extra copies of the trade paperback of the collection uh, to take advantage of that audience, and they just sat there 
and every time again i'm not going to mention names it's been uh, it's involved an artist uh that that just isn't accessible to a mainstream audience um wasn't it great for the walking dead that when the uh, uh viewers of the tv show came to check out the comic book the artist was charlie adlard i mean that was enormously fortunate because Charlie's stuff is so easy to follow. So yeah, it's a big it's a big risk for sure. And I know I, I don't know that we ever went into it thinking, oh, it's a big risk um, that the that the sales, you know, because the boys has always been have always been a very strong seller for us, you know, even before the show. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a big risk to commit the to the print runs that we committed to with the show, not knowing how the material is going to find this new potential audience. And you know, as Garth said, it, it's you can either deliver something that that is going to be a little easier and more accessible, even if the if the material is is very extreme, or something that's very very different than what they're visually processing. So, I um, I think that's something that I always try to um, stress to my audience too, like the the risks some publishers take on printing these books. Like people demand books, or like you know, you we're an audience and we and, and we're also consumers of these things that are now collected in these beautiful, big, beautiful editions, right? Like these, these are wonderful. And coming back when I took a break and coming back in the early aughts, uh, the rise of trade paperbacks from then to now is insane. Um, what it is now compared to just 10 years ago, it's insane. And I'm, I love it. Cause this is the, this is how I see my collection. I love looking at these things like this and on my bookshelf. Uh, but yeah, I see a lot of my viewers that watch the show. They're like, "Why don't Why don't publishers do this? Why don't they print more hardcovers?" I think they forget, or and they probably don't know. Like there, there's always a risk with printing books in hardcover mm -hmm. format. The cost, um, and you know, not everybody. How do I put it? Has that Disney WB money that can go right. out and just take a risk on these things, right? Smaller publishers have to take a risk because they don't know if these books are going to sell. But I'm glad yeah, I mean, you're selling for sure. You, you can go in. You can go into things with a with a good idea. Again, the boys has always been a very strong seller for us. So you know, doing the mm -hmm. different formats and going to the different uh, the links that we have. But it's really more about the commitment to the print run. It's not necessarily about the the print run, but the commitment to the print run, which is more of a challenge now with supply chain issues. We got very <laughs> fortunate. Um, you know, again, knock on wood, with all of the various efforts we've made with the boys to coincide with you know, launch of seasons, um, mm -hmm. new formats, whatever they are. We've gotten very fortunate that our printing partner um, is domestic um, and that they've had paper, that they've had supplies and that they're able to, you know, help us continue to keep these things in print and, and again, to play around with formats and do different things. So it's, it, we've been rewarded for it, but it's, 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 it's been, it's been good. Yeah, I saw uh, how well they've been selling, and I saw a couple of articles already have been forwarded from some of my viewers that there won't be another, <laughs> or they'll be out of stock until later this year as far as the soft covers, uh, which, you know, to me, it makes me happy because that's, I like seeing people read. I love seeing, uh, well, I was going to say the next generation, the younger generation, but not, maybe I'm not just... necessarily the boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Uh, maybe when they get older. Uh, let's start them with something like Hitman first. Uh, but yeah, I like to see people read. It's it's one of my greatest joys to pass on to to not just my kids, but also my viewers on the channel, suggesting things, and also that there's also this world outside of the big superhero books, Marvel and DC. Um, I started something called my hidden gems, like books that not a lot of people talk about on the on my channel, and those do really well. Like, uh, people really enjoy those. And I mentioned Sarah. And this is what goes back to so, and it's not that Sarah is not well talked about, and it is in the comics community. But I have a viewership of people that just started reading comics, and I wanted to bring that to their attention. And holy crap, Garth, that book! So good. And you talk about working with a, somebody that has a realistic style. That was a uh, Steve Epting uh, that was on that book. Who's a yeah. man, phenomenal art. It has come a long way from. Um, when he was drawing Avengers and stuff like that. Yeah, he was, he did an absolutely tremendous job. Now he, he's an artist that I had never actually worked with before. Mm -hmm. um, and when that happens, 
there's always a sense of risk. You can look at the guy's art on another book, on another writer's book, and think, well, this this guy can clearly draw. It's beautiful stuff. But will we click creatively? Will he follow mm -hmm. the script? Will I, well, I needn't have worried because he turned in one of the nicest art jobs I've ever had on one of my books. I mean, it was just beautiful. And anyway, in terms of following the script and clicking creatively, it was like he was looking in my head. It was just wonderful. Um, I should say he's actually working on another one of mine right now, which will appear sometime next year. It's, um, it's similar territory to Sarah. It's not a sequel. Uh, anyone who's read Sarah will know that would be quite tricky, yeah. but <laughs> definitely similar territory. And, and when you're exploring territory, I see pictures behind you and I see uh, mm. how much research do you take to do a lot of these war stories that and not just Sarah, but even like Punisher Born, Punisher Nam, mm. uh, those type of stories. Like how much research do you like to do? And is it something you I assume you enjoy doing? Yeah, um, it's not so much a question of research in terms of starting from scratch, because I've been reading about this stuff most of my adult and, in fact, teenage life. Mm -hmm. um, having grown up on war comics and developed an interest in military history because of them, um, I have a good deal of background knowledge on this stuff anyway. So when I start a new story like Sarah and so on, any research I do is kind of fine tuning mm -hmm. what I've already got. Um, you, can, you can never make a story 100% accurate. You, you, you reach a point where you realize you have to, you have to go with what you've got, cross your fingers and hope for the best, but you still try and make it as, uh, as accurate and as true to life as possible. Um, Sarah, I think was one of those stories where, um, everything just came together. Uh, my almost lifelong interest in the uh, the woman who fought for the Soviet Union against the Nazis, um, the uh, the publisher TKO, who were enormously helpful and supportive, and uh, the contribution of Steve Epting, which yeah. cannot be understated. Uh, he just did a wonderful job, brought everything to life in fine style. That book reminds me of being a kid and learning all these things through comics. I know it sounds ridiculous to mm. a lot of people, but I, I I remember I made the statement to Carl Potts the other day when I was talking to him because um, he had written a couple of issues of The Punisher and a couple of his buddies from NAMM came back. And it, and I, I had told him about, like, yeah, I had no idea, like, the part, there was a part of Vietnam that, you know, spoke in French. And as a kid, I mean, I was, like, 10 years old, 9 years old. I'm like... Mm -hmm why are they speaking French? So I, this is back before the age of the internet and I had to pop open the encyclopedia I had at home and start reading it. But because of that, things like that, that you all write into these stories, you know, people go and do their own research. I Same thing with Sarah. I had no idea about that, that mm -hmm. part of uh, the war. Well, that's exactly what happened with me. I mean, I first learned about uh, the Vietnam War in a war comic. I first learned about the woman who fought for Soviet Russia in a war comic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what sparked my own interest. And that's what led full circle to me writing my own war comics on those topics. Um, the one in question was it was a British anthology, a weekly anthology called uh, Battle Action. And in fact, I've just... Um, have just written uh, a battle action one-off special, which I think will be available in the US in September, which celebrates a lot of the characters that I read as a kid, um, which is another aspect of the thing coming full circle for me. Uh, and it's a nice thing to be able to do, to highlight the contribution of the writers and artists um, to this comic that 40 years ago set people like me down their creative paths, uh, but also was very important for comics in general. It's where the sort of British comics renaissance of the 70s and 80s that feeds into um, things like Vertigo. Yeah, Many of the writers and artists cross the Atlantic. It's where all that began. Yeah, and one of the things that Garth has talked about in the past that you mentioned something earlier, Omar, about you know, disliking superheroes. It's it, and Garth has said that. Although maybe your your feelings have gotten stronger over the years, but what you what you've said what you've said often in the past is that you just you didn't grow up with them. That's you right. Know, That's they, right. They were uh, they were not they were not the dominant children's entertainment in four color printed form in the UK right. that they were here in the states. Yeah, and even uh, even. <clears throat> 
peculiar to my, well, almost peculiar to my own circumstances. Uh, where I grew up in Northern Ireland, um, the distribution of American comics and their British reprints was so spotty that I almost never saw them. Um, so this is a quirk of fate, really. It, it's not my, my dislike or disinterest in superheroes is not innate. It's just born of what was put in front of me and what was available to me uh, in terms of comics when I was a kid. And those American comics just weren't there with any kind of coherence um, because the distribution was so irregular. Um, that meant that, of course, I went with what I had, and that was that was British comics, and that meant 2000 AD with Judge Dredd, but it also meant Battle Action, the war comic, and that's what took me down the, the path uh, that, that I've really been traveling creatively ever since. Had it not been for that quirk of distribution, had I gotten my hands on American superhero comics like everybody else, I would probably, if I was writing comics at all, um, I would probably be writing exactly the same thing as everybody else. We, yeah, you're right. I mean, we wouldn't have had things like um, Hitman, Preacher, Punisher, and that's, of course the boys. Like, that's it possible. definitely. It definitely would have taken you at a different path because I think you're impacted by the time, it at what age you you are reached with these books. I think so. Also, but uh, what feeds into my work a great deal more uh, than I think a lot of people um, would be the um, film and TV and prose fiction mm -hmm. that I was enjoying at the time. Um, the boy you mentioned, preacher. Preacher is far more heavily influenced by the movies I watched as a kid than any of the comic books I read. Oh my gosh. I, I'm not going to spoil it in case people haven't read it, but that ending is one of the most beautiful endings for, <laughs> for, a, sh for, a, for, for a comic that's considered blasphemous by some. I Oh my God, that thing made me cry. And, oh. and your addition of all these 90s things in there, you know, the Bill Hicks, and oh man. Um, so that's that you know, I think amongst your works, that's probably my favorite. It's up there with Hellblazer and the boys as far as like some of the greatest things you've done in comics for me. I bet everybody's different. But what would you say? Like what, what, what would Garth Dennis say? What's what's your favorite work that you've done in comics? Um, probably Sarah. Yeah, it, really. It would be one of the war comics. It it might be something like like um Dear Billy from the Battlefield series. It might be Nightingale or The Last German Winter from the uh, the War Stories series. Um, I'm very pleased with the way the Battle Action Special has turned out. So it would it would almost certainly be a war comic. But if I had to pick one, it would be Sarah. Sarah, okay, that's also a good answer. That's that that is a great book. I know that they're they're coming out with a hardcover too. I think sometime yeah, they are. This, this month. Uh, so I'm very excited for that because I think that will be the first one. Any any hope for you to return to the world of the boys? I know that you did Dear Becky. Um, it's not impossible. It's not impossible because something about that uh, that story does stick in my mind in the way that perhaps the others don't. Uh, I mean, Preacher had a very final ending. Yeah. Uh, but it was ultimately a happy ending, and I, I didn't feel any need uh to go back and do more um occasionally i revisit the world of um hitman without actually going near the characters of tommy monahan and not the hat um but i do drop in at noonan's bar from time to time you know right six pack right bay tour right bueno might do that again but the boys yeah, it's it's hard to say. Right now, I don't have anything definite, but so long as the door's open and there's no reason it shouldn't be, could be. It's always possible. Well, I'm just going to show you something, Garth. So we have volume one, two, and three. I'm just saying it could be a volume four with Dear Becky and a bunch of other stories in that head of yours. That would you know? need quite a lot more material, I think. Well, that that Garth, once if we do that, that'll be the fourth volume, and that'll be that that furniture piece that we're talking about you know where we just print we print all those comics in one hardcover and it's like an ottoman or something so yeah hey, yeah a good. Little, little companion piece yeah i think that would that would look good it'd be that size look good on the shelf i'm all or about something the... or something to chain to yourself and throw you off a uh <laughs> throw you throw you off a bridge <laughs> yeah <laughs> hope, hope that the uh pages rot before you hit <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Or we could just get lazy and part it out with scripts. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Always, and, always and possible. Died. That has been done before. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, not it's yeah. not uncommon. Have either of you have you all kept like I, I have to I, I have to ask because creating this would be so awesome. I mean, you've created so many things. You've had fans tell you, you know, oh, I love this stuff. But when you go into the world of television or movies, it has to be different, right? Because it's your vision, but it's being like portrayed by someone else. Um, you, know, you have a director and, and screenwriters. Like, have you all kept up with the boys? Like, what do you? Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you what do you think of the series? I mean, I've I've even written a, a episode of the um, Diabolical animated show, which was something I enjoyed very much. Mm -hmm. um, I I like the show just like I like the preacher show. To me, the purpose of the show was to sell the book. Okay. That that is the ultimate purpose of the show. Uh, that's nice for me because, of course, the income from the, the sales is always welcome. But also, it keeps my story current. Yeah. Keeps it relevant. Keeps it keeps my story from slipping into the background. So uh, it's really win-win when it comes to to these adaptations, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. With with this season, I've actually enjoyed seeing what they're going to do. Um, knowing the the stuff that they're they're doing not not in advance or anything but like seeing that there's got you know seeing that they're going to go to russia seeing that um hero gasm is going to be a story so for me because this was a very long time ago that we were working on the actual those issues it's a refresher for what we had done in the comics and then also um how they're going to do it and i've i've found that they've kept the spirit the tone it's nice to see you know um, a bit of dialogue in a t episode title or a storyline title as an episode yeah. title, um, even if it doesn't do the same things that the comic did. You know, I, I think that that's the nature of any type of adaptation. And the the bottom line, as I said earlier, when being able to hand the book to someone that may have just seen the show and not read the comic, knowing that they're going to come away enjoying that comic as much as they like the show, if not more, you know. Mm hmm. I had heard that, um, and I saw it last week, that Hero Gasm was going to be part of the show this season. And all I remember thinking in my head was like, there's no way in hell it comes close to what it was in the comics. They I gave mean, it a go. They gave it a, they gave it a good old-fashioned go. I think they gave it a good go, yeah. We were just talking about that the other day. I was saying that when I first came up with that storyline, um, the title came from a, uh, the name of a shoe store here in New York. That I happened to be walking past. It was called Shoegasm. Oh, okay. I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of in my life. How ridiculous. That's the that's just dumb. That's click. <laughs> was, wait a minute, wait a minute. And uh, you know, I don't even I, I never went into the store and I don't even know if it's still there, to be honest. That they, they may have gone out of business, but at the time, and perhaps to this day, everything is something gasm. Oh, so, yeah. Hero Gasm seemed like the obvious place to go, but that is, of course, what actually went click in my head at the moment. I just, as as I told Garth, I, I think it's just amazing. You know, when I just seeing the word hero gasm, or seeing again in this season that there that love sausage was going to be in there. You know, I was I was remembering when those scripts were coming in and that art was coming in. You know, Jay Allmeyer uh, and myself, Jay was in our production department. He laid the book out and just the the fun we would have looking at what, you know, we worked on it, but just it always amazed us what was being pulled off in nearly every issue. So even giving even them giving it a go, you know, it's just it's it's amazing that, that, that that's their source material. And I mean that in a compliment. Garth knows I mean this is a compliment, but it's just. It's it's fantastic, you know. It's 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 fun stuff. But again, both things exist as their own things, you know. And I think so. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were we were talking, and that that book started. I think Garth started writing the boys in two thousand six, which you mm -hmm. know literally is like a lifetime. Or you know, you add the pandemic and everything is like maybe three lifetimes ago. You know, it's it seems so yeah. long ago, and things were so different in two thousand six, and still all the themes and the ideas and all the basics of the series are playing in 2022 very well <laughs> for good or for good or for ill <laughs> absolutely mostly for ill yeah, yeah mostly for fucking ill absolutely <laughs> uh, 
I think uh, what you said is really true, though. Like, and that's why I enjoy it about the voice. I think one of the when I, whenever I do overviews of the hardcovers or the omnibus editions of Dynamite Sense, one of the things I try to push is like people are like, <sighs> there's always a, a group of people that I get it. You know, violence is not for everybody. The sexual content is not for everybody. Um, but then there are people that haven't read it that would be okay with that stuff if they read it because there is a deeper story in there than what they see. Uh, or what they hear. I'm sorry. Sometimes it's a case of what they hear and what everybody else is saying. Mm -hmm. And it's just uh, the gratuity of it is just too obnoxious or whatever. But you know what? I heard, I heard of the same shit with Preacher when, you know, yeah. that was coming out. Sure. Uh, when you write, you know, books like this, uh, particularly in comics, you, uh, you understand how it's going to be portrayed. I mean, I'm not naive about the way people are uh, a mainstream um audience is gonna is gonna perceive material like this is gonna talk about it it takes it takes the uh the reader to have a certain quirk of their own mm -hmm. see through to uh perhaps the underlying story and themes of the book um it, and that's that's true of almost any comic it's just that um uh with when it, you have something like uh the boys there is going to be a good deal of violence there is going to be a good deal of kink why is that well it's because of it's because of what the book is about it's about the it's about me answering the age-old question what would superheroes be like in the real world well they'd be a nightmare uh they'd have the effect on our world uh that politicians do with the uh, kind of glitz and surface attractiveness of pop stars and movie stars which is a bad combination to begin with but what that means is people opened up to enormous temptation uh it also means the other thing it means of course is corporate ownership um it means people using superheroes as commodities to solve problems in this this, the real world and trying to monetize that that the temptation will lead to a great deal of very kinky behavior and monetizing effects on the real world will especially when you're talking about superpowered beings will uh lead to often catastrophic violence for example attempting to use superheroes to take down a hijacked airliner yeah recipe for disaster that was I remember reading that in the comics. That was rough, and it, and I thought that that was handled pretty well in the show too. I thought they did a good job of handling that the way it was done, because of course uh, things have changed right in the last ten since you all since since yeah this book was published. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of things called social media now. We I think we may have had MySpace back, but maybe it's it was not near none of that was no. nearly as prevalent no. As, no as it is now. For sure. <laughs> Consider that the boys ran from uh, 2006 to 2012. Uh, yeah. I mean, Twitter might have come in at the end of that. Possibly. You might have gotten a you might have gotten a whole second chance at cancellation if it uh, if uh, <laughs> <laughs> social media had been around. Maybe very, maybe two three times. Who knows? <laughs> very possibly. You know, I want. Uh, I am of course not on social media, but I do wonder if that would have saved me. Smart, smart, you're a smart man. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've got a couple of questions from our audience. I put sure. some up. We kind of combine them together. Sure. Uh, just uh, t we we talked about uh, preacher, and that that's something I've been curious about. But this was a really good question. Working on something like preacher was that something that you had planned from the beginning with Steve Dillon? Uh, or did it go in a different direction with different twists and turns? Or did it, or was it originally planned to end the way that it did? Um, Preacher, uh, and and it's extremely unlike the boys in this regard. Uh, Preacher came in fits and starts. Um, the ideas that are in it occurred to me uh, very slowly. Now and again. I would I, I probably thought about it for about a year year and a half maybe even two years before you saw the first issue um and so the characters took a long time to become clear for me it took a while for me to realize that cassidy was going to be irish that he should that his part of the american story should be that of the immigrant um the actual title preacher came along quite late um the notion of the saint of killers 
Um, that wasn't there straight away. As for the actual ending, I was about two years into writing the book before that occurred to me. Oh, okay. Um, so you you have this thing that sort of develops very slowly, um, one piece at a time, without necessarily any sense of coherence. It doesn't go A to B to C. I I, I thought up these various uh, these various components. Uh, almost, uh, almost individually, uh, uh, almost independently of each other, and then brought them together into a coherent whole. Whereas with the boys, it was ten times simpler. It was um, superheroes are bastards, and they need a slap, and these are the guys who are going to do it, and that was it. And as for the um, the the overall arc of the book and the ending, that was there from the get go. Okay. So that was from the okay, excellent. Did any what was there any influence on the creation on characters like Cassidy and Preacher? Influence from like someone that you knew or oh, I see. yeah. Um yes, there were. Um there was uh first of all, Cassidy represents that sort of Rabelaisian roguish figure that we see throughout a lot of um Irish literature and Irish creativity in general. Uh, you, you only have to read the lyrics of the better Pogue songs uh, from the eighties, for instance. Okay. The Cassidy-like figures appearing in in songs like "The Sick Bed of Cahollan and "Sally McLennan. Um, I did know someone kind of like Cassidy, who very much like the character in the book was um, instantly appealing, fantastic company, um, a brilliant bloke to be around, and then later on turned out to be not everything he seemed to be. I, I've, it, it's that old, I'm sure everyone has had this feeling when you encounter uh, a new friend with a particular group of people and they all love him. And then you encounter other people who knew that guy earlier or in a different context, and they have a completely different take on him, a darker one. And uh, without going into detail on, on who this guy was, um, I'm pretty sure he's dead now, to be honest with you. That was my experience with him, finding out that not everybody loved him and that there there were things he had done that uh, that weren't, that didn't fit in with this fun-loving rogue personality uh, and that was what that's very much what influenced the development of the character throughout the book i know this is almost like picking favorites in, with kids and things like that whenever i ask this question um but did you have a favorite artist to work with um it probably was for a long time steve dillon um, the the influence of that of the man on 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 my work and as my friend um, is really enormous. Um, to this day, if I don't know who's going to be drawing a script, I'll imagine Steve Dillon art in my head as I as I write the script. Uh, this goes back to that absolute clarity he brought to his storytelling, but that's enormously helpful. Yeah. Uh, that nuts and bolts quality that his art had, it helps you just tell a story in your head. It helps you lay out a page in your head that you can write the script from. Um, it was it was Steve's uh, storytelling uh, skills. Uh, and I was talking about this recently because there's an exhibition of Steve's art that his family have put on. And I, and I was talking about this in an interview mm -hmm. um, that uh, that a chap who was was doing a piece on it did. But it was his storytelling skills that I think more than anything else allowed Preacher to succeed. It helped that he drew every issue. But what really, really helped was he understood that, first of all, the storytelling had to be gin clear. And also that when the crazy shit happened, it had to happen against a background of recognizable normality. Yeah. There's no point in uh, an artist drawing a world that looks weird to begin with and then have preacher thing type things happening in it because people will go, well, people what the people we saw in the bar or in the street or the cops that we saw on patrol were weird enough. They were strange enough. So who cares really about this 
a supernatural gunfighter or the kid with his face blown off. Everything's weird. Steve made sure that that wasn't a problem. Steve drew reality so that when the weird things happened, they stood out a mile. Um, and that, I've always thought, is a big part of Preacher's success. Was there was there ever a time on especially books like Preacher that you had editorial step in and say, that's too far? A uh, couple of times. A couple of times, yeah. Um, a line here, a scene there. There was never anything too invasive. To be honest with you, where I really ran into trouble with, on Preacher was when I was doing the letter column, which <laughs> I wrote for the first... Um, yeah. Uh, or edited, I should say, for the first 40 or 45 issues before before they stopped doing letter columns in DC books. Mm -hmm. and I think it was because even though I was doing it and even though I signed off at the end of every issue with, with my name and it was plainly me, they said that it, it seemed as if this was the editorial voice of DC Comics and we can't have the editorial voice of DC Comics saying the things you say and print, <laughs> printing the letters you print. Uh, I got some good stuff on that book, and, and a lot of it uh, just couldn't see print in the letter column. Did, did they uh, collect those? Did they collect those letter columns in anything? Yeah, they collected some of them in that uh, that series of hardcovers, the slipcase editions. Okay, I think, I think they're called uh, Absolute Preacher. The absolutes. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're in this one. Some of the letter columns were collected at the back of that, but but they're nothing to the stuff I couldn't print. Uh, you know, I got everything from uh, a guide to butchering the human body for human consumption uh, to a letter from a guy who'd had a claim to have had a relationship with the, uh, well, let's just say someone on the Unabomber's legal team uh, to, um, to a guy who was in prison who kept demanding that I come and visit him in Texas while I'm living in Northern Ireland. Uh, to a guy who decided to circumcise himself using only a scalpel, cotton wool, and ice to numb the uh, to numb the pain. Yeah, that's how you do it. And he went into some detail. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> this was after he was very proud of his work, Garth. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was after he got out of hospital, of course. Yeah. He went into some detail on that too. It, it seems like people are braver. Of course, we call uh, people like this. Uh, what, what do they call them? Uh, keyboard, keyboard, keyboard warriors. warriors. Yeah, um, behind right. So I assume back then people were braver when they sent letters. Did you ever get letters about like the, especially books like Preacher, right? Like uh, mainly because I worked at a comic book store when as the book was coming out, and we had a. A, a, a group of people, I'll say, standing outside one day when they had heard about the book, but they had the wrong damn book. They were going after something else. <laughs> like, yeah. But they were describing That's a scene of an, <laughs> of an angel with a demon having sex. I cannot. Re I wish I could remember. It was like Wonder Woman, maybe. They were, maybe it was like uh, William Mester Loeb's Wonder Woman they were trying to, and I was like, are you talking about a preacher? Yeah. Get, did you get letters like that? Yeah, we got a few, but but not as many as you might expect, because I think people's overwhelming reaction to Preacher, if they didn't like it, was simply to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. um, I got a few things. Um, there were letters that uh, there were uh, there was more than one I got from people who um, had bought preacher for their dad who happened to be a baptist minister or something oh. and handed it to him and of course you know that's when the fireworks began but to me that's that's just ridiculously stupid you even looking at the covers of the book should tell you that something's wrong there and if not a quick flip through it should confirm any dark suspicions that you might have so there's no excuse for that kind of thing but really on the whole not that many letters of complaint P people who didn't like it just walked away from it yeah i don't remember i don't remember we we, we didn't have a letters column in boys but i don't remember getting maybe maybe nick did <laughs> yeah, but possibly. uh <laughs> i don't i don't remember getting getting angry letters or what are you guys doing i think you know at some point i think that as Garth said, I think that that kind of went away, or that just became internet fodder. You know, Ooh, yeah, I was going to say 
you probably you don't pay attention that. to it. It doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say one thing I found, and I was talking to the, I mentioned that battle action comic. Mm -hmm. I was talking to the original editor of that, a guy called Dave Hunt, who edited the comic back in the 70s. And I was asking him about this. And he said that when he got letters of complaint, uh, serious ones, and he once got one from a British member of parliament, he would always write a detailed reply defending whatever it was that the comic had had shown or portrayed and he said um and that would be the last you would hear of it and i find the same thing in the uh, the preacher letter column if i printed somebody's letter and replied to their complaint i never heard from them again now i compare that to nowadays where yeah whatever the complaint is will go on forever because people will not let it go because social media gives them the tools to to bear a grudge and express that grudge for all eternity. I, I once heard a comparison. Um, I think it was when I was talking to Chris Claremont, somebody brought up the comparison of like uh, what it is to now complain to a writer, an artist or whomever, an editor, and what it was like back then. Back then, you you meant it when you put a damn stamp on it because you had to go and get a stamp write the letter, put a stamp on it. You've got to be really pissed off. I guess he gave you some time to think about, well, I guess I'm not that mad at Garth Ennis. I won't send him this angry letter. But nowadays you're right in front of the keyboard and if Garth Ennis has a Twitter account, how dare you do that to Cassidy? Or, you know, it's just... Jokes, so jokes on them, because he doesn't. Right, which is smart. <laughs> Very nice. yeah. But I think, I think it was actually, it was probably working on that preacher letter column uh, that taught me... That I didn't need a Twitter account. That I didn't. That, that when social media came along, I understood that it was fundamentally that it was something I didn't need to worry about. Partly because I'd already established myself, mm -hmm. but partly also because I understood that the number of people who will drop a book when they're pissed off at it uh, is actually comparatively minor. Now that's not the same as people who'll drop a book because they get tired of it or bored with it, right? But if you're telling the story and you're determined to stick to your guns and go down the path you've chosen, there's not a lot you can do about that. But the number of people who will actually stop reading a book because they're angry, very, very few. And that takes us back to uh, when you were talking about uh, the Punisher on the uh, Marvel Knight series where Spider-Man and uh, Wolverine and uh, the Hulk were all dragged through the dirt. Um, I'm sure, yeah, I know people were angry about the portrayals of those characters, but it made no difference to anything. They, they carried on reading the books those characters appeared in. They carried on reading The Punisher. <laughs> and Wolverine's my favorite character. And that bar fight scene with... <laughs> We get oh, yeah. no, that was awesome, man. I loved it. Yeah, besides, he regenerates. It's fine. These yeah, things come by. It's gonna come by. Um, I have a question about the. This is uh, something I haven't read yet, but now it's piqued my interest based on the comments here. Uh, there's a book that you did called uh, "Lion and the Eagle," mm -hmm. and it's about an Indian soldier. Is that correct? Uh, one of the characters is an Indian. Yeah. One well, one of the lead characters is an Indian soldier. There's also uh, there's also a uh, a unit of uh, Nepalese Gurkhas. Okay, uh, I was just reading what this uh, person wrote. Yeah, and apparently you gave them a big spotlight. And what was the thought behind this? Because apparently a lot of pop culture and movies don't do this often. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the Lion and the Eagle is uh, about a British special forces operation to put a large a uh, unit of uh, of troops behind Japanese lines and therefore cause havoc uh, in 1944 in Burma. Um, the, the mission, of course, goes wrong. Uh, the lead characters are a British officer and a British doctor, uh, but one, probably the most important supporting character is uh, an uh, Indian uh, Havildar or sergeant, Mm -hmm. uh, a Sikh soldier who has been with the British officer from the beginning. Uh, and it's his support and ultimately insights, I think, that bring that British officer to an, uh, to a, an unfortunate understanding um, about, about his place in the story and about Britain's place in, in the story as well. Um, 
but uh yeah good character to write actually he was inspired by um uh by a, a, an indian soldier who held off a japanese attack single-handedly uh with, uh when all his, all his own guys had been taken out of the fight and uh yet he managed to survive he was he was found unconscious uh with a great many wounds uh, surrounded by Japanese dead, and he survived to be given uh, a Victoria Cross, which is the British equivalent of the Congressional Medal of Honor. You know, it's the ultimate award for bravery. Um, afterwards, like many men uh, awarded medals like that, he'd said something along the lines of, well, I didn't think I was being brave, I was just doing my job. But it was nice to be able to highlight the contribution of, uh, of Indian soldiers to that campaign. Well, people are really grateful that you highlighted or put a big spotlight on that particular character. And this is published by Aftershock. Is there any, right. are there any plans for them to do hardcover collection of that particular story? I don't know about a hardcover. That's something that tends to depend on sales. But I believe there will be a trade paperback collection um, later this year. Well, I can't wait to read it because that sounds awesome. Mm. Sales, man, it's got Garth in his name on it. That that sells, man. Um, so, I uh, where can we find Garth Ennis this day, these days? Uh, where what is uh, Garth Ennis currently working on? Well, let's see. Um, Hawk the Slayer is coming out from Rebellion. I think that's mm -hmm. halfway through its run. Uh, there'll be a new series of Jimmy's Bastards called Jimmy's Little Bastards. I believe that starts in August. Okay. Uh, there'll be another Punisher book towards the end of the year. Uh, the Battle Action Special will, I believe, go on sale in the States in September. That's already on sale in the UK. Uh, I just launched it at a convention in Northern Ireland. Um, and beyond that, uh, well, there'll be, there'll be a good deal more war stories and horror stories. I just can't go into detail right now, but they are on their way. Excellent, excellent. Um, I want to thank both of you uh, for s coming on. This is, this has been a pleasure. I've been I, I met you at a convention, and I know you hear this a lot from interviewers, like probably fifteen years ago. Oh, wow! And it's not like it's not like we stand out or anything because you meet so many people. <laughs> uh, but you were so pleasant to talk to, and honestly, I was a little uh, taken back because I was like, "It's the guy that did the boys. It's the guy that did the preacher. He's mm. gonna be freaking nuts to talk to." And you were just like, "Oh, thank you." Like you said, yeah. I'm looking, I'm like, oh, he's pretty laid back. So, yeah, a lot of people talk like that. Although, you know, conversely, I know a lot of people who are absolutely crazy mm -hmm. personalities, you know, dominate any conversation, get a few drinks into them, they're the life and soul of the party. And uh, when they try to translate that into some sort of creative endeavor, writing mm -hmm. or art, it often falls flat. So it's always the quieter ones you have to look out for. Yeah, watch out for the quieter ones. The quieter ones. Uh, thank you, thank you all so much. Uh, the boys has been a blast to do all reviews of their beautiful books, and hopefully, everybody gets to check them out that has been wanting to check them out. Well, I, at this point, I like to tell people where to follow you on social media. But guess what? You can't follow Garth Ennis anywhere. Are you doing any convention appearances? Which yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. Um, there will be what I believe is called Terrificon in Connecticut mm -hmm. uh, at the end of July. Um, there will be Baltimore, Joe. I believe that's yeah. We have we have Las Vegas at the uh, I forget the yeah. name of that that convention. There's a convention in Las Vegas, the tail end of I believe August, and then um, I think that's actually third third weekend in September. Isn't oh, September, it? September, September, and then um, more and then. Baltimore at the tail end of October. Yeah, that's right. So those that's will be. My, that's one of my favorite conventions in the states. It's it's wonderful. I love Baltimore. It. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Too, actually it's uh, it's just right. Lovely town, friendly people. Conventions not too big, not too small, just right. Yeah, if you're there, Omar, uh, this year, stop by, say hello. Oh, you know, you know, yeah, I will. you know, I will. Uh, I think my wife wants us wants us to go to New York Con, or she's using New York Comic Con as an excuse to go to New York. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll be at New York Comic Con. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you, gentlemen, and you are always welcome to come on, no matter what projects you want to talk about. Uh, this has been a blast. And thank you, Omar. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you all. And everybody that asked the questions, thank you all for asking questions. 